Greetings, I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, and welcome to this edition of the Boardroom Series. Uh, today, we're honored to have Tom Campbell. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Future Grasp, uh, but most notably uh, has authored the artificial intelligence, uh, essentially the doctrine for the United Nations. One of the biggest challenges in artificial intelligence and on our pursuit of AGI uh, is what is the global standard, uh, just like we had to identify that with the internet. How do we do this responsibly? What are some best practices? And of course, during a, a coronavirus outbreak and season, uh, it's important to understand what the role is that technology and AI plays uh, in, in any type of uh, situation, uh, as we have been able to adapt uh, AI to, we believe it impacts uh, most every area of life. So Tom, thank you for being with us. And uh, Pleasure. certainly uh, delighted to uh, to hear your thoughts uh, as it relates to to AI and, and and current events. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Roland. And before we start the conversation, I'd like to make a, just a few short introductory remarks to remarks to kick it off. As you mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Futuregrass, which is a global advisory group focused not only on identifying what the next big thing is in technology, but also what such capabilities mean, that is to say their implications for issues such as national security, economics, globalization, and society writ large. I formed Futuregrass to build upon my almost three years in the U.S. government when I was a senior intelligence officer advising senior policymakers in the National Security Council, White House, and Pentagon on all emerging technologies and their implications in national security. The Futuregrass team itself offers a range of services for corporate and government clients, including written thought products, expert briefs, global network access, and organization and facilitations of roundtables and workshops. So as you mentioned, AI is the attention of states for its potential to contribute positively and negatively to their economic, defensive, societal, and political postures. As a platform technology, one that yields numerous applications in diverse areas such as robotics, defense, social media, financial services, healthcare, et cetera, AI has seen increasing engagements by nation states, especially in the last few years. Numerous states have proposed and implemented national plans or strategies to guide their interests in AI leadership. Significant implications exist from the adoption or non-adoption of AI by states. By identifying which states have national plans or actions taken toward drafting them, as well as the preponderance of government-sponsored AI investments, which as you clarified, we wrote in the national um, report with international report with the United Nations, we can obtain both a foundation and insights upon which one can appreciate potential global impacts of AI geopolitically and economically, as well as what it means for the specific communities or sectors. According to the most recent data, as of say last month, there are some 50 national AI strategies now in place or being written globally. This number has increased about 10 from the future grasp identification in its July 2019 report, Artificial Intelligence and Overview of State Initiatives. So there's intense interest by states around the world in this space. Of course, now with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, the range of geopolitical, cybersecurity, and economic and other ramifications to technologies such as AI. Futuregrasp will soon publish a seminal white paper, in fact, I'm finishing the last edits of today, in fact, called Globalization Following Coronavirus, Business as Usual or New Normal. This was co-authored with my whole team of five folks, uh, four senior, uh, former U.S. government officials, um, and we'll be offering a webinar in a fireside chat of our own with authors and a few other select external groups to go in more into depth on how the pandemic is changing our world. And once we schedule that webinar, I'm happy to share it with you and can share it with your uh, context if that would be of interest. So I'm happy to go through and discuss whatever you'd like, Roland, in that context. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, so a couple of things. First of all, as it relates to 50 nations coming up with their own protocol, AI protocol, you know, governance mm -hmm. has been a, a cry from, you know, a, a handful of people that are very close to, to uh, in, in the development of AGI. Uh, and, right. and so what does that governance and oversight look like? And traditionally, government oversight doesn't happen until it's too late. Like, you know, wrecks have to happen before there's oversight on automobile manufacturers or, you know, things that people have to die and things have to get kind of bad before right. they start putting in preventative measures and policies that uh, for the greater good. So uh, as it uh, relates to, and of course, we've been screaming for that uh, 
the right dynamic and maybe not laws, but at least put in, have the task force, have these conversations. So it's a good thing that they're having these conversations and putting in different plans, uh, but to do so that d in a way that does not hinder creativity and really the development of that. It's just that when it comes, it is containable, controllable, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and does right. it out of hand. So what, what are your thoughts? And especially uh, as it relates to the United Nations, I know, uh, the same thing happened. We went through the same evolution with the Internet uh, and every country still has different policies, right, uh, of what is is permissible um, as it relates to online access. Uh, so so where do you see it going, uh, AI policy from that perspective? So that's a very broad question. I'll, I'll sort of bend it down a little bit. Um, first off, from the plans themselves in the context of Every state is doing things a little bit differently. It was actually quite a fascinating sort of global tour, reading all the AI national plans and strategies back in early July, as early 2019, when we were drafting this report, which, by the way, it was, it was uh, under uh, advisory support is the official parlance that we were able to use within um, the report itself. So it's future grass is the template. And on the second uh, page, there's two logos of United Nations, which, as you can possibly imagine, were a little bit difficult to get on any private industry report, but we had to go through UN reviews. And boy, I thought the United States government was tough on reviews. The United Nations is a whole nother level. <laughs> it's just a, a quick side, short, funny story. I learned that there's a new version, there's a version of United Nations English, which I was not aware of. So in writing that report, they actually have a mashup of British, English, Australian, and every English version there is. So it was fun to write the report. But as we were writing this report, I realized, you know, it's it's fascinating because the reports themselves, at least back in 2019, ranged anywhere from five pages to over 200 pages. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really interesting because some of the countries really doubled down. A, a classic example, I would say, would be South Korea. South Korea went greatly in depth at what they're doing. There's all the major players here. That's how it's going to play out within their government. Japan did the same thing. A couple of the other Western European countries and particularly some of the below the equator countries got very, very, it was very, very short shrifted, which that's just their style. That's fine. And, and, and the, any advisement, we, we advise countries and so forth when actually in discussions to advise another country, which does not yet have an AI national plan and helping them develop their AI national plan. And I emphasize to them, look, guys, you have to make sure that it fits your cultural, your societal, your demographic, your sort of range of geopolitical interests, because otherwise it'll end up just being a nice report. You stick on a shelf. It's a done deal. You get a little money out of it in the government, and then that's it. When it plays into governance, the things that we saw, um, again, it, it becomes culturally, societally language specific and so forth how deep they want to go into it. So I personally feel that the governments which have the most successful AI national strategies in place right now, so the United States has a really great one, Germany has a really great one, Japan, China have really great ones, and there are other examples, just sort of picking on those off the top of my head, are the ones that went really in depth. So they actually did agency to agency assessments of how each AI national plan should be leveraged within their country. And then even more important, that they apply funding for it. So one of the biggest failures that we see in some of these AI national plans is that they'd write a beautiful report. It would be very lovely to read, and we would have to cite it. And I have a, a graphic I, I, public, I printed out yesterday from another consultancy group, which has details of all the 50 global AI strategies and so forth. But if they didn't apply any funding to it, it's kind of meaningless. So as you can imagine, anything, if you're, it, it's almost equivalent to say, if you have a, a venture capital seed company, you want to have come in and say, we love your product, go for it, we'll help you advise you, but you give them no money, it's not going anywhere. It's as simple as that. So the governance question, again, the agencies, the ones within the governments of the select nation states have to be involved at the agency and even sub-agency level. So you have to have buy-in at all these levels. So the United States is a great example. They have done, I think, a wonderful job overall um, in going through and assessing each one of the agencies, the sub-agencies, how much money they've spent, how much money they could spend, what they could do, and then tip, tip it up and tip it up so that you can actually meet your objectives and goals within that AI national strategy. And moreover, within the AI national strategies, I urge countries, whomever we talk to amongst my, myself, my colleagues within FutureGrasp, 
don't let it just be a dry document. Let it be a living document. So it can't just be something that is set in stone forever because as we see, especially seeing these last two months, times change rapidly. I mean, it it is amazing. And we can talk about what this, this pandemic means to the world right now, what we think it might mean, but nobody truly absolutely knows. But you can be really thrown off guard by things that are complete disruptors to global society, to global economics and everything. And unless you're adaptive enough to be able to maneuver around some of these things, your country will not be as effective as other countries within this parlance of artificial intelligence and then technology writ large. The last comment I wanted to make, and it, I think it speaks a little bit to your governance question, is we cannot look at AI as just in a silo. So one of the things we attempted to do within that uh, report, our artificial intelligence overview of state initiatives, was call out the technologies which have resonance and direct effects upon AI. So basic things like semiconductors, Internet of Things, robotics, autonomy. It was a challenge whenever I was in uh, briefings with Senate or Congressman or White House or National Security Council back in the day. And I left the government just full disclosure about two and a half years ago. So times have changed quite a lot since then. But I think it's still somewhat relevant is that we would be hauled in to give a briefing and we'd be asked, OK, tell us what the latest grid is on AI. What is going on? And we would, we would brief them and to the best of our ability, both unclassified and classified knowledge. But then I would always say, well, it's not just AI. You need to look at it. Also, what's going on, particularly in, say, semiconductors? So there's a whole massive body of research, massive hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars of global investment in semiconductors. And if you ignore that space, your algorithms won't run. Your deep learning searches won't run. Um, you can pretty much kiss off your AI national strategy because it won't be effective. Correct. Same thing um, with cyber. In fact, I've spoken. Same, yeah, same yeah, thing with uh, cybersecurity front. So you can have the offensive AI product. Uh, but every right. every advancement in the uh, AI offense uh, requires, you know, an equivalent uh, cybersecurity defense, uh, which cybersecurity Absolutely. has to be. Uh, you have to have AI cybersecurity. It's almost not enough to say cybersecurity more because we think firewalls and perimeter mm -hmm. protection, and you have to be thinking right, right. AI. Uh, you know, the, the deep learning of, of of attacks, so it gets to learning. The different modes and, and, and right, methods right, right. And so that it can uh, automatically know how to respond. Right. And you're absolutely right in that, Roland. And, and about four or five years ago, when I was in the government, myself and my colleagues, we forecasted that it was going to be AI versus AI in cybersecurity realm. Yes. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon your worldview, that's sort of coming true now. And we talk, of, I, I don't know if we talk too much about it in that specific report, but I've written extensively about it elsewhere in that the context of there's so much data. There's so many devices connected. And that's one of the things that's being discussed within the context of we're all working from home right now at this present moment. I mean, I personally have maybe in our house, maybe 20 devices connected to the internet, at least. I know I know colleagues who brag, oh, I have over 100 if you have all your TiVos and all these other things and so forth. But it's, uh, we have so many devices and you multiply that times 7.8 billion people, whatever the, the demographic and uh, from poverty level to wealth level is, there's trillions of devices connected to the internet now. No single human, no single company, no even large Google or any company can accommodate all that from a personal perspective, looking at it as a human. So it, it, the algorithms are essentially required to assess cybersecurity tax, cybersecurity forecasting also. So one of the things I think very, is very powerful about AI is you can deep learn so the activities within, say, a computer or an enterprise system and so forth, and then look for aberrations. And from a microsecond perspective, which is what is necessary or even small, shorter than that from a necessary from an attack vector perspective so that you can avoid and cut off that aberrant behavior right away. Yes, and it's not all modeling. That, it, it really sleep, is. Eat. It's not modeling. It's based on actual data. So in the past, if yeah. we did that, for, the forecasting was based on modeling and predictive analysis. Right. Uh, this is more right. uh, computative and, and, and uh, empirical data, mm -hmm. really, because it's not based on probables. It's based on actual. Right. So, so question, uh, and, and, uh, uh, as AI relates in the, in the business world to the government and defense world, uh, they, those to me are very two different tracks. Uh, and I, I want us to touch yeah. on both. Um, yeah, sure. because I think it's, uh, AI is, is, is a beautiful thing. I think we already, it's already a part of our lives in, in many respects. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And then, so so maybe we can speak to that, to the business developments and advancements on on, on that front. And, and it does improve our daily lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the flip side, mm-hmm. uh, it, especially as it relates to uh, go, uh, defense, national defense initiatives, uh, where we mm-hmm. are in the pursuit of uh, an artificial general intelligence that can, uh, you know, completely defend in, in every way. Uh, against uh, any any attack, mm-hmm. and of course, that's what uh, a couple of people, uh, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and others, are concerned that will uh, have the ability to destroy human, um, you know, the, the human race. I will say that I, I firmly yeah. believe that uh, you know the three greatest advancements in warfare in human history: ammunition being the first, nuclear being the second, uh, AGI being the third, which we're currently in uh, the, the the biggest arms race the world has ever known. You know, to create that, because uh, to your point. It will be, uh, you know, it, it'll end up being something like AGI against AGI um, uh, in, in terms of future warfare, perhaps. But especially whenever so many of our weapons and systems are are, are essentially computer runs anyway. Look at the, obviously with drones and, and and even tanks and ships and, and so forth. They're computers that we have the ability through satellites and every every other way to alter to to uh, we can we can cause mm-hmm. the circuitry to burn or to explode. Uh, you know, and we can send. Charges. I mean, there, there's all kinds of a different way of looking at tactical defense. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And it, there's some really great people I know uh, directly within the U.S. government still at levels in the Pentagon. So the NSC AI, National Security Commission on AI, and then the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, the Jake. Um, they're all very much on board on these things. In fact, we, I, my, myself and my team have briefed them several times on our recent work on geopolitics and AI national strategies and so forth. The great challenge with, as you said, AGI is, well, number one, how do you reach it? Um, one of the things that I'm personally wondering about is, will we even recognize it if it is achieved? Uh, so, for example, the grand question, this gets in a little bit the philosophical, and there are whole academic tomes written about what is consciousness? What will we see AGI? Will we know it? Yeah. And, and I don't want to get in get into that sort of squishy territory because I'm just an engineer myself. But um, there there definitely is a, a debate within the community. Actually, one of the the funnest uh, workshops that I ran when I was in the U.S. government was uh, and the first part of his online, and I actually had the guts to invite two philosophers to the meeting and they they went at it and they were completely different opinions and myself and all my IC colleagues are just sitting back and going wow we had no idea and, and so forth and they get completely different opposite perspectives about what is consciousness and so as we as you say in the report a little bit so or at least in one of my other articles let's let's think about the example of an animal so an animal may or may not be self-aware, depending upon the, the size of its brain, the, the ecosystem in which it operates, its intelligence. You can talk about everything from an ant, uh, which is basically a drone, nonsensical animal that moves around purely on instinct and endorphins and smells all the way out to, say, a crow, which is pretty clever and can pick up things and then orangutans and so forth. But are those considered sentient or not sentient? irrespective of whether they're sentient or not sentient, self-aware, they still have an active play within their given ecosystem. So they they change their ecosystem. So beavers build dams, whales eat krill. I mean, all these things that are constantly evolving and going back and forth. And so one would be hard pressed to say if we had a computer, even if it's not sentient, but it was doing demonstrative things that are changing our societies. So robotics and so forth, we're getting to that point. Is that AGI? Is it? Does it matter if it's self-aware or not? I would actually argue that it may not matter a whole lot. And from a cybersecurity perspective, I'm actually way more worried about the brittleness of our AI systems than any future AGI. And so there is a huge debate within the AI community. How soon will we reach AGI? There have been multiple surveys I've seen. Some folks will say, oh, next year, all the way to never. I mean, I think the average breaks down to something like 20 years from now, which is kind of the, the general kick the can down the road futurist and forecast because 20 years from now, no one's going to remember what we said. <laughs> yes, right. Well, and it's the exact same conversation uh, as it relates to quantum computing. So they, they, they the, the same, the yeah. timelines are exactly the same. If you think that it's going to take 20 years to he- reach AGI, you think tw- quantum computing is 20 years off. If you think it's in two to three years, then you think AGI is two to three years off. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree uh, on, yeah. on that. So it's so a question. Let me yeah, go. so whether yeah, or not we reach... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. 
So whether or not we reach AGI within our lifetimes, number one, we may not recognize it if we do. And number two, does it really matter? Because if we have computers that are controlling our every system and enterprises, particularly in corporate, it's so complex now. I mean, you go to in a big corporate, a Fango or one of these other companies, they write their own operating systems. They do their own uh, code. And that's actually one of the things that's being bandied about right now in terms of the implications of what's ongoing right now with the coronavirus pandemic is small businesses are being squashed because they can't really go out and do their due diligence. And they still always say rant and these other things where the big companies may be on the rise and they may coming out of this pandemic, hopefully whenever it is mitigated or suppressed entirely, the disease itself small businesses may be less um, effective or efficacious in general than the big corporations which have the enterprise systems, the data and these other things. And so that's actually a concern of mine personally, running a small business as I do. I mean, we're successful in everything, but for many other companies and startups I've heard from within Silicon Valley, they're struggling because uh, suddenly you can't even get together. It's, you have to do all your code um, back and forth over the computer. You can't get together for whiteboard meetings and other things. Whereas the larger companies, they already have all these things set in place. Work from home for them is not a really big deal. I mean, Twitter and Google and a couple others, Apple were one of the first companies, the large companies to say, everybody must work from home, which I applaud because that helps flatten the curve, as they say, within the pandemic situation. But it's a lot harder for SME, small business, medium enterprises to do that kind of work. So oh, I, no, we'll see where it develops. But, and I think that's really the relevant conversation here is, is the... Uh, there was a lot of preparation done for this. There is a reset. Uh, what th There's been a lot of pushback on advancement, some advancements, uh, in, in the adoption of it by by different organizations or different sectors, uh, different industries. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare being a major one. Uh, you know, uh, it's, right. the, the Uber was able to displace the taxis, but, uh, but it hasn't displaced the uh, healthcare system. Some of them were more entrenched than others. And so there are right, broken right. systems, fundamentally broken and egregiously broken systems uh, in place mm -hmm. that have nothing has moved them off center uh, except for mm -hmm. this. So the fact that, you know, you can still you could have done telemedicine. Te telemedicine has been most of it has been HIPAA compliant since about 2015. The problem was not that. Right. right. And the problem and, and, and it was not even that consumers would not have uh, gravitated to that. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's uh, th there are there are other, you know politics and so forth at play financial uh, and the econ economics really of this is 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 critical um i i do want to talk about that specifically as it relates to to the executives and the ceos that are watching now but um i, I will right. put this on the consciousness uh, and uh, and self-awareness of, of agi or or you know what it, what determines when it's agi uh, i think that uh the, the consciousness conversation is almost uh uh, some, to some degree, a distraction uh, to, to, to real AGI because uh, because artif because if it was conscious, then it wouldn't be artificial. Uh, so we would not have it'd be real intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, and and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is the, 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 the multidimensional computation of, of, of these things. It's still ultimately mm -hmm. mathematics. Right. It's still ultimately uh, you know different types of physics. Um, and so um, uh, we don't have to get. We don't need to create. It, in fact, the, the the concern is that it's going to become so smart that it outthinks us. And if I say, and they're doing this from the the Go games and you know so forth, but if I program the computer to achieve, you know, I want to have uh, peace on Earth, uh, then it may end up saying, well, the best way to achieve peace on Earth is if I blow everybody up because people are the problem. So mm -hmm. therefore, we eliminate it, just like a video game. And so that's where right, right. fear comes in from it. Uh, but that also assumes mm -hmm. that there is no parameters. But part of AGI is that mm -hmm. the code itself can write code. So it can learn and write its own code. So if it is writing its own code, yeah. if there aren't over, is, if there's not oversight, if there is not some threshold, and just like not all countries are allowed to have nuclear weapons, uh, there mm -hmm. is a strong case, which is why the UN report I think is important, uh, that, mm -hmm. that AGI, to the degree that it can you know, tap in if to a weaker country's cybersecurity systems or, or that control weapons and implode all of our nuclear, you know, plants or, 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 or weapons, uh, you know, around the world. Um, here's the thing. Just like the Internet leveled the playing field for businesses, really, because a small uh, a, a, a solopreneur could now mm -hmm. have a website and sell just like Apple. The website is mm -hmm. the same website. You 
one does not have advantage over the other. It's their ability to drive traffic to their respective web page and if people want the product or service. It, in many respects, nice. that is what the AI uh, has the potential to do. But it's 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 really yes. the oversight of that. So so how can businesses uh, uh, use AI? And, and I ask this because as a CEO, when I was CEO of the hoverboard, for example, company, mm-hmm. you know, you 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 spend so much money on technology, and, and half of what these people tell you it'll do, it doesn't do. So you buy stuff that it doesn't work, it, it, or you know, not the way that you expected. And so we've poured so much money into you know technologies that were uh, inferior. Uh, but we know the answer isn't to stop purchasing technology. It's just how do we get better at making better decisions and how do we actually mm-hmm. get better products on the market? So uh, so mm-hmm. let's talk for talk to me for a moment about the economics of AI in a business. So the economics of AI. So I'll, I'll go high level first. So within the world. I mean, there, there are several many reports that have come out and said, well, it'll be a $57 trillion industry in a few years. Yes. And it's what I just was reading just before we joined the discussion that um, everybody in the, the consulting world, the large, large consultancy global firms are saying, well, actually, there won't be much reduction in workforce and the AI perspective during this pandemic. Yes, we're working from home as, as mandated, and that's all proper to flatten the curve and so forth. But there are many, many people um, who are unfortunately being unemployed. There's about there's forecast to be 30 percent unemployment in the United States by next month, which if you look back in history in the Great Depression, the, the peak of unemployment was 24.9 percent in 1933. And that took us four years to get to that. So we are doing this within two months. And so fortunately for people working in AI, there's still intense demand for AI. Um, I think it is imperative for every company within the context of what they do, whether they make a physical widget or they kick out software and try and create an app or something, to seriously consider, if they're not already considering it, looking into AI and what it might do for their company. There are whole books written about how enterprises can leverage AI. My company itself, we advise companies and, and governments about how to do this. Happy to engage anybody of interest. But in general, the, the, the challenge is to tailor it to your specific needs and interests. So the nice thing about AI is that, as you so correctly point out, Roland, it can learn fast and it can learn and do deep learning. You can pour data at it if you have the right algorithms and you'll be able to do things computationally way faster than any human can. It can look for patterns. It can look for different trends that may not have been discernible just as even if you toss 100 analysts at a problem. I, I even joked when I was in the in government that my own very job might be questionable in the next coming years because what does an analyst in the government do? We think, we write, we absorb data, we process it, we punch it out. It's kind of formulaic. It does take an extreme level of expertise to be able to do it. But as you point out, there are there are AI algorithms right now which are already at the very basic level doing these kinds of things. Code is writing code. Um, five years ago, I visited Carnegie Mellon with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Robert Work. Um, and we went and visited some of the great professors there and we saw them writing, having algorithms, at least sort of bug bounty code directly. And that was the first time I'd seen that. I think it may have been the first time Robert Work saw it as well. I don't know for sure, but it was quite impressive. And so that was five years ago. So now we're getting to the point where Google and some other companies have come out with their own algos and saying, actually, we can do this quite well. And uh, so the code can write code. There's still obviously a tremendous human element that is required, though. I'll be the last person to ever say we're going to be able to step away, wipe our hands, go sit on the beach in in Florida or wherever you want to be and just let let the algorithms and AI do our jobs for us. I don't think so. Not, Not in the near term, at least. Um, robotics and some other things are still quite a ways away. Um, if you try and get a, create a robot that can walk up and open a door and, and, and seamlessly walk right through the door without falling over several times, it's a great challenge. Um, there, well, there are but, excellent but, companies yeah. out there doing that now. But so the companies themselves, and just uh, if I may finish this real quick, have to look in, and this is speaking very, very large, um, have to look in depth at Number one, what do they wish to accomplish? Because you can spend a lot of money and end up wasting a lot of money too. The the, the hires for artificial intelligence, if you want a top level program, are in the seven figure salary levels. I, I was talking with a Stanford PhD student 
last year and he said he oh i've got seven offers already and he was only a year into his phd at a million plus base level salary so to hire a, somebody of a high quality is going to cost a company a lot so before you make that investment the board the c-suite should really step back and think what do we hope to accomplish engage with the experts whether it's small advisory groups like myself or much larger companies that do this for a living because we can help you kind of point and steer and uh, navigate the waters so that you don't end up wasting time and money as you for future forecast and plan what your company would like to accomplish. So that's a very broad answer uh, in that context, but that's what I can say without getting into specific market sectors at this moment. No, I think it's fantastic. And uh, and I will say that I think, you know, the rates, your future graphs rates are are a, a great value for for companies to oh, appreciate it. thanks and i i appreciate at the end of the day i wanted to make it a win-win for whomever we were that's the key so i want to make sure that others benefit even more than me that's that's the core so yeah. well you know and one one example that you used was you know obviously in robotics and with robotics uh yes doing a lot of automation and really the difference between automation and and, and artificial intelligence uh, but specifically the you know opening doors and a lot of the human interactions there are some things where humans don't uh, and this goes back to the consciousness conversation to some degree because it's not that we need it to think because it actually can computationally you know do a lot better than most uh, any what a, what a person can but uh but it, yes. but it, the one thing that robotics doesn't do is care and as humans we need that connection and so there are some right uh, if ro the robot can open the door and say how are you today uh you know mr campbell but uh, but yeah. what I cannot do is actually care at an empathy level of your response, your response, uh, you know, right, so, right. because of because of the mechanical nature. So I think uh, the, the fear is unfounded, but I, I do recognize the need for for human connectivity. I think it's innate in us. Yeah. Um, and, and and also along the consciousness is always uh, what role does emotion play in robotics? Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's just so many different industries, but I love the advice that you gave specifically to, to executives and business leaders and business owners here, uh, because I, I have seen AI disrupt in a positive way, the small little yeah. local farmer, you know, on a few acres of land that it, it, where they have oh, yeah. Yeah. tomatoes or by size or by color apples, for example. Um, and it'll automatically mm -hmm. little homemade conveyor belts, send it to the right thing just with a, yep. your yep. cell phone camera and, 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 and software and it's also easy. yeah and that, they can those, all get into ai yeah those those are maker kind of projects too you can do that yourself almost nowadays yeah. with the right and you can download the code it's all available yeah absolutely and, and there are several a couple websites where uh th that that are platforms uh, for you to be able to to create some custom ai mm -hmm. software for your for your company uh but it, th mm -hmm. th 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 so you can apply it to a small business and not just spend in, in, in the millions and millions of dollars trying to do something, uh, you know, massive. Also, right. I think, uh, and, and I would encourage business, even big businesses, some of the, the, the curse of big business sometimes is that they throw money at the problem instead of brains at the problem. Uh, and they, and, and, and initially, <laughs> well, I think we all do that. Role, we, <laughs> we do. That's what I was about to confess. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, at one point it was easier for me to throw bodies at a problem than it was to really think yeah. through. It was, okay, let's add 10 more people to that department and solve the problem. And right. so we solved it with right. either you know money or- Well, if I could sprinkle pixie dust on the world, it would be empathy and foresight. Because I think that's what much of humanity, unfortunately, lacks. And so we try our best. The one other thing I wanted to mention, in addition to the great point you make about lacking of emotions of the algorithms, is core understanding. So, for example, if you and I read a novel or a text of any form, and we come across a word and we come across a phrase, we will immediately get it, what that means, and true meaning with a capital M. An algorithm will scan the text, but it won't have a clue what those individual words mean. Yes, it can go to a dictionary or a thesaurus and so forth and look up comparative words or definitions, but it won't truly understand what it means given the context of a lifetime of living as a human. There are body. There is a body of work I'm aware of, and I was just reading about last week, in which some of the fangas are attempting to un inculcate meaning into an algorithm's assessment of text, which is sort of a national or a, a natural language uh, processing NLP, as they call it in the parlance, and NLP holy grail uh, for a computer to be able to do. Once that is broached, once we cross that bridge, and others are working at programming and emotion and empathy and so forth. It will be that much more difficult to discern 
is that really a computer or is that really a human? I mean, it's a great question of the Turing test. And the, the Turing test is, is, is for those re, um, watchers not fully understanding, in 1953, I believe it was, Alan Turing posited that if a computer could talk to you in a conversation and you couldn't tell it was a computer, you thought it was a human, then it would pass the Turing test and it was actually a really smart computer in essence. So the Turing test can be fooled. Uh, there was the, the most recent award of the, of, the, of the Turing test competition internationally, I think some of the, I believe it was a Russian or Ukrainian group, faked it. It was an angst-filled teenager. It was the computer. And so it had all these uhs and ums and put these interrogatives and sort of parlance. And so they, they won because they, people thought, well, that must be, a, must be a person because no computer talks like that. So they actually had to, had to dumb down the, the lingo and the jargon of the computer to make it appear like a human, which I thought was quite a funny. But um, so once we reach that level of understanding and emotions in a computer, embedded in a computer, at some level, I think that the word, the term AI itself, kind of like the internet and kind of like some of the other earlier technologies, will sort of drift away. It will just be a computer. You and I will be talking. I have my Google Home. I just tell it, order it to do things, and it picks up my uh, specific uh, linguistic uh, intonations and so forth, and it'll do it. It's getting that point. And if you'd asked me 20 years ago, would that be possible? I would have said, oh, I'm not really sure. But there's some wonderful startups in Silicon Valley I'm aware of that are even taking that further. So to actually have a conversation with a computer. I've read, for example, that the elderly in this state of all working from home, stay at home mandates by states and governors and governments are talking more and more to their Apple series, Google Homes and Cortana, Microsoft Cortana's because it's the only thing that they have to converse with, mm. which is, I think, a fascinating anthropological, psychological uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Potentially might be good, potentially might be bad, but that's going to become one of these things that are potentially coming out of this pandemic, we're all stuck at home situation now, is we may be even more embedded with our computers. We may be getting very used to video conferences. I have Zoom all day long. It's just like one of my colleagues said, I'm having death by Zoom now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it, it's it, we're getting so used to all these things now, it's sort of become secondhand to do these things where 20 years ago, we wouldn't have even thought it was possible. Right. Uh, so 20 years from now, who knows? So we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, it's a nudge that needed to happen uh, across multiple industries. And so on, on one hand, I'm thankful. Uh, I wish it didn't take this uh, to for us to uh, progress. Oh, yeah, we are. Lots but, of deaths and illnesses. It's bad. So, yeah, yeah. But, but, but also, you know, when you look at history, uh, we can keep this in perspective, uh, you know, and understand that it's, it's you know, it, it's bad. It's not uh, the end of the world. Uh, and, and hopefully people can keep their wits about them. Uh, Facts and data always uh, kind of can dispel uh, fear. Mm. Uh, and so I, right. I think one other aspect as it relates to the NLP uh, in AI is, you know, it, it's a real issue. And as businesses create, uh, especially try to learn maybe from employees even, uh, mm. their AI language, it's, it's going to be important. It's an ongoing work because even if you and your wife have conversations, there's still lots of misunderstandings, right? Uh, and, and <laughs> we, we come to understand our spouses, that would be a huge leap forward in humanity. And, 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 right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that's, and we, yet we have shared experiences. We have things, right, we, right. we have uh, hidden meanings and, and uh, inside right, jokes, right. as we would say in America, uh, which, right. which means we both should understand what we're talking about when no one else does. Uh, so our shared right. experiences creates its own vocabulary uh, and weight path mm -hmm. of communication. And so as it relates to, to, uh, to AI, obviously a lot of news articles are currently being written by algorithms. Uh, you can give it a couple yeah. of data points and it spit out. Yeah, your sports page is like 90% written by an algo. Do you know that? Yes. yes. So in if fact, you, if you're oftentimes sports prior fan. to the game taking place, uh, it can, uh, yeah, yeah. it's almost a forecasting what's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they fill in and, and with amazing accuracy, with amazing accuracy. But, uh, yeah. but, but, but it still goes back to, I think the work still has to be done is, is like you said, on the empathy side and also understanding the, the, uh, w it won't achieve total perfection because that's part of what makes us human is that we aren't rational mm -hmm. beings really, uh, you know, in, oh. in many times, which we've seen demonstrated globally. Uh, over the last few weeks, yeah. uh, when people, when otherwise rational people uh, are faced with an emotional condition, people react and respond very differently and very irrationally. 
Yeah. Um, and that is very difficult for a very linear, logical, computational kind of thing to process. But once again, AI will begin to even get stronger and know here's how the mass, the masses will respond to X, Y, Z. And, and, and it's almost like the, the incubators. And we know if we do X, Y, Z, this is going to be the general response. And they know they're going to have 5% that, that refuse. They're going to have another 5% who, you know, or 10% with saying it's all manufactured and just to you know, take away our freedoms or what have you. They, they, they just have all the data points about how this goes. But you also cannot ignore the economics of, of challenges. And what we've always said is there's always great opportunity in the midst of great adversity. Uh, if you choose to look at it that way. Yes. And if well, you look at what the stock... If I may interject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may interject real quick on that note, Roland. So if you look at that back at 2008, 2009, some of the greatest Silicon Valley startups, your Square, Uber, got created in that time frame. Because the entrepreneurs, maybe just the startup, the really young men and women startup founders, and I've talked to a number of them who are stuck in their tiny Silicon Valley apartments, are sitting around coming up with crazy new ideas. And so in this respect, this might be a good thing to be working from home more because we tend to get a little bit more creative when we're outside of our cubicle and away from our manager or whomever else. So I actually would forecast, is there's gonna be some amazing creativity coming out of this uh, scene in, in the next few months or so? Because we've seen that trend, some of the, I think it was, I saw a list maybe of the top 15 companies that came out of the last recession in 08, 09. And it's striking. These are billion dollar companies now. Um, so I, as, a, as a comment, as an aside, I, I advise Silicon Valley startups, I advise Silicon Valley venture capital too. So if any of your colleagues would, or the watchers would like connections back to the Valley, I'm typically, when in normal life, I'm there at least once a month, talking to my VC and my uh, other colleagues out there. And corporations should also look, try not to, if you don't need to, don't invent it yourself. There's a froth in Silicon Valley of startups. I think they have come up with almost every idea known to man in terms of how to capitalize upon AI. So if you're in, say, a Midwest or an East Coast or international company and you're looking at, well, we really need to do this, instead of going off and hiring a whole team, training them in your culture, trying to bring them up to speed, you may just go buy out a startup that's already doing it. And the, and the folks out there are just brilliant. I'm actually stunned with the less than 30 year olds that I'm continuously working with. It, it just, I, I feel honored actually to be working with those folks because they're, they're excited, they're amped up, they're creating something new and creativity, I suspect will ratchet up during this time frame, even though there's incredible suffering, many deaths, horrible things going on. Obviously people are isolated. The plus side though is we may get some new startups, we may get some new companies out there that if your eyes on the ball as a big company or even as a, as a medium-sized enterprise, you may be able to latch on to something that others, your competitors, don't see during this time frame. That's exactly um, right. So, I'm, and again, I'm happy or even to, to give directions, even if it's not my company directly, I can point your colleagues to folks that could perhaps do that sort of thing and happy to do that. Well, I certainly appreciate that, uh, Tom. And, uh, you know, I think to... to when you look at uh, one of the reasons for the uh, growth in creativity during this time, I think, is the noise reduction. Uh, there's less clutter. There's less noise. There's yes. less distraction. And um, when yes. you sit around, it, you know, I remember the uh, being interviewed for a CEO job one time, and they asked me, they said, how do you manage your time? Uh, and mm -hmm and throughout the day with all of the different, because there's all kinds of competing demands. Everybody wants to meet or have a phone call or have this at 11 o'clock or one o'clock or, you know, all throughout the day, right. there's yeah. all these competing demands and you have to choose. How do you choose? How do you manage your schedule? And I remember, yeah. you know, my answer to them was, uh, you know, I constantly, I go into a day, uh, you know, with my day scheduled out, uh, actually I go into weeks mm -hmm. usually. Uh, and then uh, even whenever I was running companies, uh, it's a year out. Uh, I already know what I'm doing on, you know, October 17th of 2021 or something, you know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at two thirteen in the afternoon. Uh, and you don't right. have to follow up with me. I will be there if I said I'd be there, you know, <laughs> but, right, 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 right. but, but the idea was when you reduce the noise and the clutter, um, you are able mm -hmm. to think clearer. And, uh, so well, your subconscious not. kicks in and, and your subconscious is a, is a getting back to the consciousness comment. It's, it's constantly thinking back here, and your frontal lobe is actually doing the action. And it, when you're freed up, so 
I, I live in the mountains of Colorado and I like to go hiking because your subconscious just can flow out and you just sort of free stream thinking, look at the gorgeous mountains and everything. And that enables at least me personally to come up with new ideas for my business and help my colleagues around the world and so forth. And so this is a really good time for people to step back. I mean, we're, we have sort of a, a running joke within the, the tech community. We all want to be Isaac Newton during this time frame because poor Isaac Newton back in the day, he had to go live, I think it was for eight months or a year during the bubonic plate, he had, he had to go live at a farmhouse. That's when he wrote Principia Mathematica and came up with the three laws, Newton's three laws. It was the most productive time he'd ever had in his life. And if he didn't have that, I need to be sitting out, get outside the city and away from all my buddies and the bars and everything else. Newton himself may never have done that because it enabled him to think a little bit. So what is the highest? I, I, I encourage everybody leverage this time to come up with new ideas, be innovative, maybe take your company in a different track that you never thought of before. Look at different business verticals even that you may not have thought of before. The world is changing dramatically and we write about this in the white paper and I'm happy to send it to you, Roland, and share with your colleagues. And I've had a couple um, former senior seniors in the US government review it and they loved it. So I'm hoping that people will be receptive to it because we look at the, the before, so the state of the world before, the during as far as as current as it can be, and then what might come after the pandemic after suppression and we try back in the in the paper to call out a few uh shall we say indicators of things metrics that might be necessary to bring us back to slightly back to business as usual but i don't think we're ever going to truly be back to where we were like international travel i would have loved to come and sat on the stage with you roland that was my would have been my preference i'm sorry we had to cancel that, more, that that airline yeah ticket. i was yeah. talking <laughs> to one of my vc colleagues it's 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 a it's an extrovert's worst nightmare to be stuck in a house all day long <laughs> so <laughs> it's really hard but to, to, to leverage this time and be able to use it so you can do something novel that you, your competitors may not be doing because they're nose the grindstone they're answering emails they're doing zoom Step back a little bit and maybe think. Um, it's just a suggestion. So that, that's that was my answer. Uh, is what is the highest? I, the question I have to ask myself at all times, regardless of the competing demands, is what is the highest and best mm -hmm. use of my time right now? That's ultimately yes. the best question. And and something like this, for example, it's scalable, it's duplicatable, and it, it and we we invest, we invest forty five minutes, but uh, but quite frankly, this will be reviewed twenty years from now. And uh, so something we do now, uh, we really are creating a thousand plus hours of other people's time that will be consumed in, in watching and so forth. Sure. So I think the um, uh, I think these are the type of things that really have impact. Uh, and so anyway, yeah. I really want to thank you for being on talking about artificial intelligence as it relates My to pleasure. government uh, internationally. It's it's a it's a unique topic. It's hard to get uh, to cut through a lot of the noise, even in the AI world. It's not a uh, you know, there is a lot of noise. Eric, yeah. esoteric and you know, the fuzzy, it's like a cloud, it's hard to get your hands around it. And really, there are some very tangible, practical things that uh, the small business, medium, large, they can all implement now without it being an ex a, a real big expense on, on the on the budget or taxing. Yes, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, they can get going. Absolutely. And so we appreciate uh, what you've shared with us today. Uh, Future Graph, Happy to. Um, obviously, uh, and, on the site there. Yeah, and any follow-ups, if you'd like, I'm happy to talk with yourself, Roland, more, obviously, and, and any of your colleagues in terms of the context. We have to get through this together. We, we can't get through this pandemic or whatever working from home situation apart. So I'm more than happy to talk with other colleagues and collaborate and, and see what's not. I've, I'm like yourself, I have a vast network of global contacts, United Nations, Interpol, all around Europe, Asia, da, 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 da. Happy to give introductions, even if it means nothing directly to me. If I can help you guys out, I'm happy to do so. Wonderful. Thank you. That's the kind of spirit and heart that uh, that we try to only work with people like that. So thank you again. And thank you all for watching another edition of the Boardroom Series. We're glad to have you. Thank you, Ron. Goodbye, everyone.